Hello, everyone, and thanks for coming to this event. I'm David Robson. I'm a science writer and author, and I'm really delighted to be here in conversation with Hannah Critchlow, who's an in internationally acclaimed neuroscientist based at the University of Cambridge. She helped present the BBC's Tomorrow, Tomorrow's World Live, uh, BBC Two's programme Family Bra uh, Brain Games. She's published Conscious Consciousness, a Ladybird Expert Guide, the Science of Fate, and most recently, um, this book, Joined Up Thinking, The Science of Collective Intelligence. And it's a really remarkable book. It's so thoroughly researched, eye-opening. Every page told me something I didn't know about what it means to be smart and how we can uh, make better decisions as you know, groups of people and even as whole societies. Um, in 2019, Hannah was named by Nature as one of Cambridge University's rising stars in life sciences, and she was also on the judging panel for the Wellcome Trust Science Book Prize for 2018. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely delighted to be here at the festival, and um, it's wonderful to have a conversation with you, David, as I have been... Um, uh, citing your books within <laughs> within my own book. So, yes, <laughs> yeah, it's good to meet you. Well, I wondered, um, if first of all, you could just tell me a little bit about, you know, why you came to write this book. Mm -hmm. It seems a bit of a leap from the last one on the science of fate. So what really sparked your um, excitement and enthusiasm about collective intelligence? Um, I think it's exactly that, that it, it kind of almost was a leap from my previous books, which were Consciousness and The Science of Fate. So my PhD research, which was done actually here at Cambridge University, was looking at um, synaptic plasticity, um, which I think is basically how our individual perception of the world forms. Because as we learn from our environment, as we experience different things throughout life, um, new connections form within our mind as we learn new things. And as the, we memorise those, those learnt things become memories in our mind, then those new connections basically solidify into a stable connection, a new motorway in the mind that allows a new, really fast route for information to be processed across so that we can form our sense of reality. And each one of us has a slightly different sense of reality due to the different experiences that we've had. Um, I also did my undergraduate degree in cell and molecular biology, and there was a huge um, genetic component to that. Um, and I became really interested in genomics, uh, and that kind of helped to inspire my next book, which was The Science of Fate, which looks at how each one of us, because of the genes that were given from our mum and our dad, um, and also because of our unique early years experiences, basically has a very individual cartography of the mind, so a really intricate and very unique um, kind of set of connections in the mind because of these genes and because of our experiences. And when we look at the numbers, there's something like 3.2 billion base pairs of nucleotides that we've been given in the form of the DNA from our mum and dad. And there's something in the region of 86 billion nerve cells in our brain. And a lot of those genes from our mum and dad are actually instructing how those nerve cells are going to kind of um, connect up when we're in a baby in a womb and how they're going to operate and function throughout life. And, and that, that connectivity actually occurs on, in a, on a vast scale. Again, there's something like 86 trillion connections within the mind. And if we think about this vastness, this huge intricacy, this huge scope for differences between each and every one of us, then you can start to see how we are each individually very, very different. We each have our own strengths, we each have our own idiosyncrasies or flaws, which is what I examined in Science of Fate. Um, and sometimes it can be very empowering to accept that we each have our individual strengths and flaws and different ways of seeing the world. But then the next question is really, you know, what's the point to that? What's the point to have, having this breadth of different behaviours that as a species we can exhibit because of this incredible, sophisticated, very um, you know, numerically powerful um, system that encodes this complexity? And the point to that is really that as a group, when we come together 
as groups of different individual people, then we can start to balance out any individual biases and create greater strengths. And so that was basically what the book's about, is you know, what's the point in having these individual minds, these individual destinies, these individual ways of seeing the world and ways of interacting with it. And the point is, is that actually when we come together as a group, when we come together as a collective, that intelligence is much more than any, any individual. And there was another thing that kind of inspired me to write the book. Um, so uh, you mentioned earlier that I was um, presenting the BBC Two programme, a Family Brain Games. Yes. Yeah. games. And um, so that was with Dara O'Brien, who is amazing. And we tested his intelligence on the show. And he's like, you know, he's up there. He's, yeah, quite an intellect. Um, but we were basically pitting different families against each other to do different, to complete different puzzles, very different puzzles that they had to work on as a group. And we were looking at which group, which family would be m the most successful, which one would win the games. It was quite competitive. And, you know, there was some really interesting science that was in that arena. Uh, and I could actually predict which family were going to win based on the scientific data that we had to hand. And it's not the individual IQ scores of the individual members. It's something very, very different. And so, that, and so basically both of those things kind of came together and I um, approached my literary agent and my publisher and I said, you know, I've got a number of different book ideas. And they said, which one do you really want to write? And I said, this is the one that I want to write. Mm. And then, and then, sorry, I'm going on now, <laughs> but then what happened is, so they said, great, okay, go off, go off and write it, and we signed the contract. And then I went around Australia to go and do a little bit of a book tour in Australia and New Zealand to promote Science of Fate. And then the strangest thing happened, 2020, the international borders all shut. Um, and in fact, the state borders shut as well. So I was trapped in Queensland at that point in Australia, um, and my flight back was cancelled. And then the next flight back was cancelled, and then the next flight back, and then the flight after that was also cancelled. So I spent 22 months oh, in Australia oh. with my son. Thankfully, my son was with me on the tour, um, and we had honestly we had a whale of a time. But I spent because of the different um, policies that they had in Queensland, the library was open. And the beach was open. So I be <laughs> and Max's school was open, and he was eligible for that because he was actually born in New Zealand. So I basically spent 22 months um, researching this book, and then I and then I came back and presented my editor with a manuscript that was double this length. <laughs> so I had so I had a, and I feel terrible saying this because the pandemic was obviously atrocious for a lot of people in a, in a lot of ways. And, you know, my friends here in England really suffered. But I, yeah, so I found myself in the library kind of in isolation in that I didn't know anyone there uh, because I just, you know, I was there traveling with my son and um, writing this book about collective intelligence as the world was, you know, shut down in lockdowns. Mm. And actually, um, you, there is a lovely story that kind of demonstrates how our differences as individuals can actually... Um, produce a greater intelligence than if we were all kind of identical. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us about that. It's making Lego with your son. And I think that's just a lovely little example of how two brains can look at the same problem from different angles. Yes, yeah, yeah. And my son is actually up there in the um, top there. So hi, Max. Um, <laughs> so we were making a fire engine to show his grandparents over um, WhatsApp video later on that day. And I was getting really irritable and really frustrated because I couldn't find the piece. There was a very particular plate that was needed um, for the roof of the fire engine. And I just couldn't find it. Uh, and I was looking and looking and looking, and I was huffing, increasingly, you know, getting a bit irritable because I'm not the pa most patient of people. And, um, and my son basically just, he was like, what's mum wrong, mum? And I was like, I'm looking for this piece to finish it off. And he was like, uh, it's there. And he just picked up the right shape, exactly the right piece, but it was just the wrong colour. So, so my brain had just been sorting things by colour, and he was a re like you know immediately could see actually the shape was more important and the dimensions of it and how it would function, and that's an example of you know how our brains change 
typically mm. across the lifespan. So the younger brain um, is, you know, that all those connections are happening, that synaptic plasticity that I was talking about earlier is occurring at a much faster rate. And his brain is much more creative, much more lateral problem solving. Uh, my brain is much more finessed with wisdom and knowledge. <laughs> But unfortunately, uh, my creativity has decreased and my speed of processing has also decreased slightly. Uh, and also, as we get even older, what happens is your brain does something. It, it starts placing its weight in a different way. So it will actually start taking on board less information that's coming in through the senses and place more weight on the information that's already stored within the brain. And this makes strategic sense because as we get older, our senses, so our eyesight or our hearing, might start to fail. Mm. And in a team, you might want people who are a bit more constrained in their thinking, but also someone who's maybe younger, they're more open to exploring different possibilities and they're not following the rules so kind of precisely, I Ex guess. Exactly, exactly. And so that's why when we look at, for example, multi-generational families, when we look at um, groups of people, communities, when they're working together, you can see that actually it helps to have people of different ages, so young children, teenagers, who have a very distinct um, neurodevelopmental kind of phase within their brain. Uh, so Professor Sarah Jane Blakemore was probably doing a talk here earlier on in the festival about that, that incredible period of neurodevelopment. Um, for the adolescent brain, which again is very creative, um, very good at problem solving, possibly more impulsive and more susceptible to peer pressure. Um, and there's very distinct changes and strengths that are associated with that brain. So it makes sense, you know, when you're working in a group to have a team that has children on board, adolescents, adults, and even grandparents. And you could see that going back to that BBC program that I was involved with mm -hmm. in the Family Brain Grain Games. You could see how the different individual members were each able to contribute very different skill sets that complemented each other when the individuals were properly listened to. Mm, so that's definitely worth considering if you're putting together a team for a pub quiz, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, now, I think you have an experiment for me, so shall we go and do that? And this yes. is going to explore a little more about kind of individual intelligence, collective intelligence, and how the two interact. Yes, yeah, yeah. So what I want to do is actually peer into your brain waves, David. So what I'm going to... I think I Should might move, move this... That? Yeah, and move this here. And then you can sit comfortably. Um, and what I'm going to look at... So each one of us has got those 86 billion or so nerve cells within our brain. Um, and those nerve cells connect up to form this circuit board, is what I was calling it earlier, with those eight to six trillion connections. Um, and then, basically what happens is each nerve cell pumps sodium and potassium ions in and out of the membrane, and that pumping of charged ion basically creates an electric current that zips across that nerve cell, that then electrically activates the next nerve cell in the circuit. And that zip of electricity kind of moves around at speeds of around 120 to 200 miles an hour within the brain. Um, and it can be activated by information coming in from our senses to... Sorry, I'm going to take your hand there. There we go. I'll put that there. From our senses. So all this information coming, comes in from our senses, electrically activates those nerve cells that are in our brain. And that information, that electrical current zips across the brain at speeds of around 120 to 250 miles an hour and allows us to process information from the outside world so that we can create a sense of reality and instruct our, our um, kind of brains and bodies how to react to it. So what we're seeing here, live on stage, is David's raw electrical activity within his brain. So I'm going to hold this nice and still for you. What we've got... Oh, that's me. <laughs> messing around with the, with that. Okay, now we've got a nice baseline. I'm going to ask you to wriggle your eyebrows very furiously, and we should. There we go, and we're seeing a response. So that's picking up on the electrical activity, the motor cortex here, which is instructing the um, muscles within the forehead to contract. But we're also picking up on the electrical activity of the muscles contracting as well. So the green band in the middle is the raw electrical activity of David's brain, um, and scientists like to categorise things. They like to break things down and 
put them into groups, and they've done that exactly the same with the electrical oscillations. And so they've broken them down based on frequency, so kind of like the speed of electrical oscillation. Now, the fastest speed of electrical oscillation is the red line at the top, which is gamma waves. Now, I'm going to ask you, David, to close your eyes ooh, and meditate in front of everybody. And what you should see <laughs> is an increase in gamma wave activity, not a decrease. <laughs> uh, what happened? <laughs> oh, right. so, so what happened? So, <laughs> so when, when I got um, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, and I am name dropping here, when I got him to um, meditate in front of 1,800 people at the Hay Festival, you, he was such a good meditator that you could see instantly his gamma wave starting to increase. And so basically what happens is meditation is thought to increase this gamma wave oscillation. Now, gamma wave activity, is, as I said, is the fastest speed of electrical oscillations. And it allows disparate regions across the whole brain to communicate with each other, to send signals really quickly across the whole connectome, across to different regions of the brain, so that you can have joined up thinking within your own brain. Now, alpha waves, the blue waves at the, um, just below the gamma waves, are the slower speed of electrical oscillation. They're associated with calm creativity. So you seem to have slightly larger alpha wave activity, but not now that I'm talking about it and putting you under pressure. <laughs> um, oh! <laughs> So what we find is that if you're, if you're really trying to problem solve, then um, you know, it can be very difficult to do that when you're just stuck at the desk, just staring at the problem. So it can help to go and take yourself out to nature, for example, or to go and have a bath. Uh, that might be where you have your eureka moment. Um, and go for a walk and go and get lost. Those types of activities actually increase alpha wave activity and help with that creative problem solving. Now, here at the bottom in the green is beta waves. That's associated with more concentrated, focused thought. Now, focus. <laughs> um, so, so, um, so what happens uh, when you're under a little bit of stress, what you would normally see is that actually there's a little bit of a burst of activity, particularly beta waves, as it helps to increase synaptic plasticity and it increases alertness, but chronic amounts of stress actually dampen down both the gamma and the alpha waves. And it also activates the amygdala, which is a region of the brain that's in the middle of the brain that's involved in threat appraisal and the fear response. And the activity of the amygdala usually occurs at the expense of another region of the brain called the anterior cingulate cortex, which is kind of more like here, which is involved in more problem solving, collaboration, and forming partners with other people, partnerships with other people, so that you can problem solve and innovate more effectively, and so that you can horizon scan. So anything that activates the amygdala and anything that's causing chronic stress does so and diminishes your problem solving ability and your ability to form partnerships and collaborate with other people and to innovate and um, look further to the future. So that's about you know, our individual brains, what we know, what scientists know to be happening within our individual brains. But more recently, scientists have been looking at what happens when groups of people are working together. And if, for example, David and I were working on a particular project, together, and we were measuring both of our brain waves at the same time, what you'd likely to see is that our brain wave electrical activity would actually start to synchronize. So they would become in step with each other. And that degree of synchronicity between David and myself could actually predict how well we're working together, how well we're building consensus, how well we're learning from each other, and how well we're problem solving. So is there anything that David and I could do to help boost our brain synchronicity to maybe help us work together more effectively. Yes, David, there is. Yes, we could look each other in the eye directly. <laughs> we could do that. Yeah. That would boost our brain synchronicity. <laughs> What's happening now? Wow, look at that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and also we could sing together, David. We could. <laughs> I don't want to do that. that. No, you don't want to do that. Or we could yeah. do some exercise together, like yeah. star jumps. We could do yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. but we won't do that right now. <laughs> so yeah, oh, wow, that really affected you. <laughs> It's like my um, fear of having to sing in public, I think. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that's kind of some of the, some of like a little bit of an introduction to the science behind um, our individual intelligence and how we can make the most of our brains by increasing gamma waves to 
um, by med meditation, practicing meditation, but also um, making sure that we take time to relax and get lost in nature um, so that we can boost our alpha wave activity too. So if we um, are trying to measure collective intelligence, you know, we know how we measure individual intelligence through things like the Raven's matrices, those kind of non-verbal problems that mm. you'd have in IQ tests, but what do you do when you're trying to work out whether a group is really smart or whether they're struggling? Ah, well, there's something called, so there's something called the G factor, uh, which is, <laughs> sounds a bit rude, doesn't it? <laughs> I hadn't thought about that before I heard that giggle. Right. <laughs> Um, that's collective intelligence in action. Right, um, so there's something called the G factor, which is basically when you do IQ scores on different people and you test different facets of their intelligence, um, then what you find is that, generally speaking, if somebody is good at maths, uh, they're likely to be good also at English, French, uh, all different types of behavior or intelligence, and that's called the G factor. So there's something about their brain biology which lends itself to accurate information processing and good problem-solving ability. And that affects different facets of intelligence, different behaviours. So that's the G factor. But now, researchers have also been interested in the C factor, which is the collective intelligence factor of when groups of people are working together. And what they do is, similarly to when you're assessing IQ, an individual in IQ, you basically get a group of people together and you give them a battery of different tests that can um, look at or analyse their collective intelligence. So, for example, um, some of the tests that they can do is get groups of people to work together to um, solve Sudoku mm. or to do the desert survival problem. I don't know whether you've heard of the desert survival problem task. I haven't, actually. OK, so, so this is where um, you've got to imagine a scenario. You're working in a group of maybe 10 people. And um, you're asked to imagine this scenario. You've just been on a plane. The plane's crashed. Uh, you've landed in a desert somewhere in the South of America. The um, pilot's dead. He didn't manage to radio ahead to say, the to say the location before the plane dropped. You're on this kind of barren land. There's not really much around apart from some cactuses. You can't see anything else. There's 10 of you surviving, and there's 10 items that you've managed to retrieve from the plane before the plane blew up. You've got to rank those 10 items in, um, in order of importance. And as a group, you've got to work together to try and decide which items are most important. And you could say it's a complex problem because obviously each one would have its own kind of advantages and disadvantages and people are likely to disagree, I guess, initially on yeah. their preferences. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So there's, so there's a whole battery of tests like that that you can do to assess a group's C factor or their collective intelligence. And what they found is that the number one predicting factor for how well a group will do when challenged with this whole battery of tests is not the individual IQ members of the people that are making up the team, it's actually gender ratio. Mm. So the higher the number of females within the team, the more <laughs> successful that team will be. <laughs> But I think, am I right in thinking that's related to social sensitivity, which happens to be correlated with gender? Well, I mean, that's that. I have to say, I contacted Professor Anita Woolley, who's mm. based in America, who did this research with Thomas Malone at MIT, um, and that's what I suggested to her. And she said, well, I mean, that's something that you might want to write. <laughs> However... <laughs> Um, so, so, so it's thought to, to be like, implicated with um, turn-taking and emotional perceptiveness. Mm. So the ability to listen, so that then each individual member's true cognitive capacity is being heard by the group, it's being offered up effectively, rather than dominance dynamics basically creating a clone-like echo chamber, which silences some individual cognitive capacities that might otherwise be on offer. Um, Anita thinks that possibly it's related to testosterone and the Y chromosome. I would like to suggest that actually it's not something, it's not a skill that is completely written out of the Y chromosome, and that actually it, it's culturally um, not as emphasised as it should be from a young age that boys should appreciate listening and turn-taking as much as generally young girls are taught to, to do. And that's what I see in the British school system here. 
Mm, that would be my intuition as well. And actually, I think we've all heard of mansplaining, which I guess is that dominance dynamic that is so damaging to group intelligence. But just because men might have the habit of doing that doesn't mean that they can't stop doing it, I guess. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, incidentally, um, there'll be time later on for the audience to ask questions, and there are quite a few people um, watching us online, and you can submit questions uh, through the Slido app, but you just need to enter a code, and I'll be repeating this again, but it's 216-2495. Um, that's 216-2495. Um, so please do get your questions ready. So we've spoken about gender diversity being important mm. for collective intelligence, but are there other predictors? Like, what should we be looking for in a good team if we're kind of re uh, recruiting people for our work or just for a pub quiz or, you know, for an escape room, you know, any of these kinds of different tasks? Well, another thing that's quite important is um, different expertise, so different accrued knowledge in very differing areas. Um, and this has been shown, shown time and time and time again. Um, but one study that I want to particularly highlight is um, there was a group in the States, again, that analysed over 2 million patents, and they analysed over 20 million publications over a five-year decade, um, five-year kind of time period. And what they found was that those more successful pieces of research that ha had more impact, so they created more patents, had more innovation, and also were more highly cited, were basically due to teams of people that were working in very diverse areas. So, for example, if you brought together a linguist, working with an engineer, working with a computer scientist, working with a psychologist, working with an um, anthropologist, say, then you've got all of these different areas of um, interest, different expertise, which can kind of um, combine so that then everybody is listened to and they can offer up different uh, new knowledge. There's also other uh, ways that you can look at diversity. So, for example, genetic diversity is thought to be very important. So, if we look at a different species, so, for example, um, bees in a hive, we know that if a calamity strikes some bees in a hive, there's a subset of the bee population that will just calmly and pragmatically get on with the day-to-day -day job in hand so that there will be honey uh, on hand for the next generations and for the future days. So they, these bees, this very small proportion of the bees, won't get caught up in the kind of emotional contagion of the disaster that's happening, whether it's the queen bee that's just died or there's some invaders that are attacking. So they will just carry on plodding on with what needs to get done and leave everybody else to kind of get caught up in that emotional contagion. Now, when we analyse the genes of those, that subpopulation of bees in the beehive, what we find is they have genetic changes that are homologous to the genetic changes that we see with people that have been diagnosed with autism. And similarly, those people... Um, we're increasingly seeing different recruitment strategies from companies like Microsoft and HP and Relic, where they're specifically trying to recruit more and more autistic people because, or people with, that have been diagnosed with autism, because they have skills in having focused uh, attention to detail um, and, and won't get caught up in some of these emotional kind of uh, situations that might be occurring. Mm, and I guess that could be useful for so many organisations, mm. especially when you're facing times of uncertainty that you might have some people who um, are more focused on kind of getting things done. Um, um, I think you have an, another experiment for me. Oh, I do. Yes, yes, I do. And this one is actually quite painful. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You, do, yeah so <laughs> you don't have an underlying heart condition, do you? Uh, no, I don't. Excellent. <laughs> Good. Otherwise, okay. I would have to do it on one of you. Okay, so sometimes, so um, there's study after study after study, which I mentioned in the book, that shows that basically if you recruit a diverse team in terms of genetic diversity, social and cultural di diversity, age diversity, uh, and expertise diversity, then you, and you, but not gender diversity, <laughs> then you are more likely to um, create innovative uh, kind of problem solving and increase the C factor of the group. However, as we all know, Sometimes when we work with people who have wildly differing ideas to us, very different perspectives um, and very different ways of looking at the world and very different 
ways of problem solving, it can actually be really annoying to work with these people because they like they're just there's this massive cognitive dissonance, right? Sometimes you have to explain your way of thinking to them because their their thought patterns are so different, and it it can be irritating, it can be annoying, it can take time, um, and we've got to tolerate some ambiguity. You've got to have quite a high tolerance for uncertainty sometimes when you're working in these very diverse groups. Um, but if you have that tolerance for uncertainty and ambiguity, um, and you can work in these diverse groups, then actually you can reap the rewards. Now, there's some researchers, um, particularly uh, Leila Moffred, who's based in Newcastle. She's amazing. She's been doing some work on our tolerance for uncertainty, and she's got some concerns that perhaps the younger generation because they've grown up with, for example, Google Maps and the internet on their phones, um, and they've, because they, you know, there's a lot of certainty in their day-to-day -day routine, because they can look anything up, they know when a restaurant's going to open and close, they know what the menu is, they can see all of this stuff. You know, they don't, when I was a student um, in my holidays, as well as working in a psychiatric hospital, I'd go on holiday and I'd get completely lost, right? Because there's no Google Maps. And we'd have a lonely planet and sometimes I wouldn't, even, I wouldn't want to open the lonely planet. I would enjoy that experience of being completely lost and immerse myself in that and start to explore the world in that way. And I think it was a really important thing to develop that perhaps people aren't developing that skill as much and it might actually impact on how we work with different people. Because again, it's about this tolerance for uncertainty and ambiguity. Um, and so I want to test your tolerance for uncertainty and ambiguity <laughs> by um, giving you an electric shock. <laughs> okay. And this is like, um, if I'm honest with you, this is just, it's a bit of a cheap gimmick, really. Uh, I'm actually going into my son's school tomorrow to do a talk for their at the, for the end of their science week, and I'm going to electrocute the head teacher. So. <laughs> <laughs> but it's all in the name of science. Let's see if it works. Yeah. Here. So what I'm going to do is electrocute David in the most exposed nerve in the body. Oh God. Yes, <laughs> I know. Does anyone know where that might be? He like he really doesn't know what's happening here. So this is great. Huh? Ear, face. Electrocute his face. <laughs> <laughs> is oh is yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, there. No, no, we yeah. won't do that. Um, we're going to do the funny bone. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> you know when you hit your funny bone? Yeah. It's not very funny, is it? No, it hurts. Um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to electrocute his funny bone. So, um, thank you. So, we're going to hold this here. I apologise if I swear. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to... If you hold this... That's it. And if you hold this one here... That's okay. it. There. That's wonderful. And then I'm going to press, should we count down? <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Oh, there we go. There. Oh, wow. oh look. Can you put your hand up again? <laughs> look at that. So, funny. so, look, that's quite funny. So, there was like, who had a. Oh, I'm going to switch it off now. <laughs> and I'm going to switch it on again. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Hang on, that's good. Right. Um, so that's basically to show that, you know, you had to have a, tolerate, a tolerance for uncertainty mm. and ambiguity yeah. there, which you did. But by the end of it, you were smiling and waving, right. and it caused a spark of electricity to go up your arm in the same way that sometimes when we're, you know, in a new, a new experience, working with a new set of people, it can be, cause a bit of nervousness, but then it can cause a shoot of electricity that can create a new idea and, you know, a really important innovation for society. Mm. So, yeah, yes. no, I love that experiment. Did yeah. you? Did you love it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did you? It was not as painful as I was expecting. Good. Yeah. I actually put it on the maximum uh, oh, yeah. ampage. Oh, really? Yeah, 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 yeah. I did, yeah, I did. Because yeah. when it looked like I was waving, that was actually like involuntary. Like it was the... Yeah, you can't control. Yeah. Yeah, no, you can't exactly. Stop it. No. Yeah. And had I left it on for longer, it would have recruited yeah. more and more and more muscles and it would have been more furious. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, yeah. Well, it's good that we stopped where we did. Yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, so just a reminder of that code again, it's 2162495, um, and that's just for people who are watching at home if they want to ask questions. Um, so I wondered, one of the most fascinating parts of your book looked not just at collective intelligence, but collective stupidity, and that I think is when 
you know, there's so many examples of organizations that can, you know, go wrong in some way. And I think the recent report of the Met Police is just one example of that, where, you know, things like racism and homophobia and sexism were just allowed to kind of um, spread rampantly. You know, these behaviors were not sanctioned or uh, punished. Um, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Like, what, what are the causes of collective stupidity and are there ways to prevent it from occurring? Um, yeah, so I think first of all, it's to consider leadership. So there's a chapter within the book on leadership. And I'd like you all to take part in a little experiment with me now, actually. So if you close your eyes and imagine that you're in a position of power, so imagine maybe you are a referee at a football match, or maybe you're a high court judge presiding over an important case, or perhaps you are a head teacher at a school or chair of a committee meeting. And just think about how you're exerting a big influence on people around you. And whilst you're feeling that, that power that you have, I want you to take the index finger of the hand that you write with, and I want you to trace the letter E on your forehead. Some of you did that in a capital E, and some of you did that in a lowercase e. Remember the sensation of that e on your forehead. And now open your eyes. So what the vast majority of you did just then is that you wrote it in a way, I've got to make sure I'm doing it, in a way that made sense to you, but was mirror imaged, reversed, for anyone looking out. And what they found in study after study after study is that when people are in a position of power or even asked to imagine being in a position of power, it actually changes the neural activity within the brain. It decreases the mirror neuron circuitry within the brain and these mirror neurons are thought to be involved in feeling, having feelings of empathy for other people uh, and being able to imitate them. And it also decreases the vagal nerve activity. Now the vagus nerve is a big bundle of nerve that runs down from the brain to the body. And it's really important because that vagal nerve actually picks up on lots of information that's stored within your body, which is called the embodied cognition. And a lot of that information is from people and the environment around you. So there's something like 11 billion bytes of data that enters our se senses every second, but we're only consciously aware of something like 30 to 40 bytes of data per second, which is an incredibly minuscule proportion. And a lot of that additional data from other people is basically stored within a per our peripheral nervous system, within our gut, within our heart, within our lungs, and the vagus nerve can pick up on that embodied cognition. Um, and send signals to the insula, which is one region in particular, uh, which is involved in picking up on that extra kind of information. Now, when you're in a position of power, it actually dampens down the vagal nerve activity so that you're more likely to think with egocentricity and you're more likely to just write an E in a way that makes sense to you, but not anybody else. Um, so you can see that when people are in a position of power for a long time in particular, actually they're less able to tap into the collective intelligence, the collective wisdom that's around them. So that's one problem. Um, there's, there's, there, there are possibly ways that we can start to immunize ourselves against this effect, which I also talk about in the book, and there's some lovely little exercises that you can do to help increase your interceptive ability, your intuition, so that you can better tap into that embodied cognition and listen to that gut feeling or that heart flicker that's trying to tell your brain, hang on a second, there's something here that you need to kind of pay attention to. Um, <clears throat> but there's also the fact that, you know, when you're operating as part of almost like a homogenous clone-like team, then you're, they, you, people aren't able to offer up different ideas. It's very easy to become ap apathetic or complicit uh, and just to go along with the status quo. And that's because also, you know, very much written into our neural circuitry and our genetic code is this strong desire to be part of a team, to be part of a tribe. Um, because it can be protecting, but it can also become quite bullying. Um, and I also talk about in the book what happens with morality as well. So there's some lovely studies looking at how, for example, if you start to go down a dark path and act in an immoral way, then actually your brain uh, kind of activity changes so that your striatum that's involved in motivation um, kind of changes how 
it becomes activated so that it's almost primed to want you to become to get more reward and pleasure by acting in a slightly more immoral way. So it's easy to see how you can start going down a slippery downward slide. And there's another interesting thing as well, that not only are emotions kind of contagiously transmitted. So for example, if I'm smiley and happy, uh, then it's likely that my neighbor or my nearest colleagues will be. But also, just by interacting with you, our moral values will start to align unconsciously, you know, without our awareness, we'll start to become, we'll start to interact and our physiology might even start to align as well. So our heartbeats, for example. Mm. And because I think often people say, you know, so with the examples of the police, oh, it's just a few bad apples, but obviously the whole saying is spoils the barrel. And I guess that's what we're talking about here is that actually these kind of behaviours can become contagious, like yeah. you said, and it spreads yeah. from person to person and norms are formed that then, so no one's really whistleblowing or kind of even noticing what's going on. Yeah, and it's a culture where, you know, it's difficult for people to actually stand up. Right. Or, or, to, or to also take time to reflect on what the situation is. And I think we've also got to think about the fact that there's, there is a high incidence of post-traumatic traumatic stress disorder within mm. so a lot of these forces as well. Yeah. Um, that can affect their thinking, which is, again, is something that I talk about. There's a chapter about cathedral thinking and how we've got to make sure that we protect people from um, exposure to traumatic events mm -hmm. and make sure that we can help with their re rehabilitation of them because it can affect not just their own behaviour but the effects can ripple out across society, also possibly across generations. So there's more and more studies looking at how traumatic events can epigenetically change, um, so change the, the, not the DNA sequences itself but the um, the confirmation, the shape of the DNA, and how that confirmational change could possibly pass on traumas to succeeding generations. So the majority of those studies have been done in mice, um, and also in, in worms, earthworms, where you can see these effects rippling out across 14 dif different generations. But there seems to be similar mechanisms that are at play within human species, although there is some controversy within the um, kind of different fields that this definitely exists within humans. But there seem, seems to be some epigenetic changes that have occurred within descendants of the Holocaust, but also um, people that, are, um, the SOS, Lahore's in Pakistan, mm. kind of village survivors as well. Um, so I definitely recommend to everyone to get a copy of the book and Hannah will be signing copies and selling them um, right up here afterwards. Um, but now I would really love to have some questions from the audience. I think we have a roving mic going around so if um, people could uh, raise their hands. I think we've got a lady here who would like to be the first to kick this off. So when groups of people are getting on well together and the collective intelligence is high, what happens to the synchronization of their brain waves? Are a lot of them in the gamma realm or alpha range or what? Well, <clears throat> so you'll get all of the different frequencies still, apart from, I didn't mention, but there was not much going on in David's brain in those middle two waves, did you see there? Well, that's good. <laughs> They're associated with being asleep. <laughs> <laughs> So I was really pleased that we didn't see much activity there. But those really slow electrical oscillation waves, which predominate when you're asleep, help to consolidate what you've learned during the day into a stable connection within the brain, into a consolidated connection. When you look at groups of people who are working together, now the original studies on this were actually done by Vicky Leong, who was based here in the Department of Psychology, but she's now um, predominantly in Singapore. But these studies were only done a few years ago, so relatively recently, it's a really new area of research. She was looking at parent-child dyads, um, and what she could see, so she's getting the parents and the little children to don little um, kind of caps, where there were hundreds of electrodes and she was measuring the electrical activity across all the different frequencies. And what she could see was those brain waves between the parent and the child would start to become synchronized when the parent and the child were learning from each other. And that actually sometimes the child would be dominating uh, the synchronicity and sometimes the parent would. So it's a little dance. And, and what they often see is that the more charismatic person within a group will actually lead that synchronicity, but still within that, you can take it, you take it in turns. 
Um, so you get, you start to see those electrical oscillations all becoming synchronized, and you can see all of the different frequencies within that. And am I right in thinking that the synchronization reflects processes like kind of shared attention? So you're all focusing on the same problem. Yeah. You might be feeling the same emotions, the highs or the lows at the same time. It's like very much you're sharing a reality together, and that that's useful for your communication and joint understanding of the issue at hand. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So it's linked to better learning. Um, and it's thought to be, so I was talking earlier about this 11 billion bytes of data coming in per second. So basically your senses take in information um, as stills and then your brain creates this continuous video reel, if you like. But there's different, so, but you don't constantly take in information, so there's little gaps within that information taking in, because there has to be, because of the way that the nervous system operates. And so this brain synchronicity is thought to reflect you starting to take in information in the same time stamps, so it's like you've got exactly the same camera stills, right, of information that your brain is seeing, so that you're starting to see the world literally with the same information, the same starting point. Um, I think we're ready for the next question, which uh, is there. Absolutely, absolutely fascinating. Those. Thank you very much. Um, does group size have any bearing on the effectiveness of collective intelligence? Ah, well, there's lots of studies on this. Robin Dunbar, who's based in Oxford, the other place, but he's very nice. Um, he is an anthropologist. He's got a magic number, which is 150. So he thinks the optimum size for humans is 150. And there's a particular, like, so he's looked at different species. And what he's found is that the region, this kind of area of the bane, brain relative to the rest of it is highest in humans. And he thinks the reason for that, the reason that we've evolved that is to support a larger social network. So we've got one of the biggest social networks that we can possibly have in terms of the relationships we can form with a high number of different individuals um, compared to other species, many of them mammalian species. Um, and it's that ability to have a network so that we know which person to go to for what information that can help us <coughs> innovate and problem solve that's meant to be most effective. So 150 seems to be the key number, and he's written books and many papers about that. And am I right in thinking that our, once groups exceed 150, they would start to splinter off because, because it's a separate kind of, um, I guess, set smaller groups that would be more manageable? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, th and it's thought that that's, for example, why Silicon Valley was so successful compared to the Boston Hub, I think it was, because is this from your book? Uh, no, I don't think so, but the fact <laughs> we don't know about it probably is <laughs> is <laughs> shows us why um, Silicon Valley was successful. But yeah. Yes, yeah, that place that we, yeah, that we haven't really heard of is because Silicon Valley kind of had lots of little niches, little kind of pockets where people could get together and form their little groups, their smaller groups of 150 people or so. So any, any um, structure or organisation that supports the possibility of these smaller groups forming within it where people can form these groups of 150 people or so um, it seems to be advantageous, seems to be key to success. Yeah. Um, now I think the next question is here. We've, we've now moved in our work uh, area, we moved away from social interactions in person and more towards mm. online interactions. Mm. How much is that a hindrance for that synchronization and for no, the yeah. team no, play? Yeah. No, yeah. So, Vicky Leong, I think, has done some um, amazing work on this, again, Vicky, but, so, but this was pre-pandemic, and what she found was that actually you needed to have direct eye gaze contact, um, person to person, and when you tried to get the brain synchronicity over a screen, you didn't see the same degree of brain synchronicity. It was significantly um, decreased. However, that was pre-pandemic, um, and there have been some studies going back to Anita Woolley and Thomas Malone that I was talking about earlier that have shown that possibly as a result of the last few years where we've all been experiencing much more online interaction as a result of um, Zoom and Teams, um, that actually the degree at which we can work and collaborate together as a group online seems to have, through this synaptic plasticity, through the way that our brain can change as a result of our experiences, kind of gotten up to speed a little bit.
but the jury's still out on that. This is the amazing thing, right? Our brain is a constantly changing place that changes in result, as a result of the experiences. And so our collective intelligence has you know, changed as a result of the experience that we all globally experienced over the last few years. And I think yeah. one of Anita's studies had shown that the burstiness of the communication you do remotely is important. So what that means is that like, rather than sitting on an email for like six hours, if you respond quickly and then they respond quickly and you have that kind of quick, um, very rapid communication with a group followed by maybe periods of silence, that that's actually better for the collective intelligence than, you know, those long drawn out exchanges where everyone's losing kind of motivation. So <laughs> yeah. that I definitely like that made me try to be a lot more kind of on top of my inbox mm -hmm. um, because of that. Yeah. Um, do we have uh, the next, yes, the next question is there, and then I think we've got one down here. Hey, um, I'm curious about the, uh, the gender ratio being the best predictor of uh, how well a group works. I was wondering if that works all the way, like, all else being equal, will just an all-female group outperform a large group of women with just a single man in it? Is, does it go all the way up to 100%? It goes all the way up to 100%. Oh. So it's like, and it's the most robust <laughs> predicting factor for collectors, like collective intelligence, according to Anita. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and this is looking at um, over 800, 900 different people look doing... So in 900 women, a single man can detract from their performance. <laughs> no, this is like, this is different. This is many different individual studies. I know, it's like pretty damning. I was surprised. So diversity is good, apart from gender. <laughs> and I think this was something you also noticed on the family brain game. Oh, yes. Now, this is really interesting. So when everybody came in, all the different family members came in um, for their initial screening, we did their IQ tests beforehand, before they started doing the puzzles together, um, you know, with the televisions kind of rolling. And, um, and I made my prediction. I said, based on the science, this family is going to win, even though the children were by far the youngest competitors in the whole of the family brain games. And they did, in fact, win. And that's because they had three females on the team and one male. Mm. And you know what? The male editor for the programme took out my prediction. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. I don't know oh. what was going on there. Yeah. <laughs> it, was a lovely, it was a really lovely editor and producer. I just realised you're filming this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The children, so they were young, but they were, I think the youngest was eight. Yeah. Yeah, so they went, yeah, they went three. Yeah. Um, Herbert, Good do point. you like to go next? Well, there are a number of questions I wouldn't mind asking you, but I restrict myself to one on the hope that I'm going to say something that's new to you. Um, and I'd like your opinion, especially if it is new to you. In the mid-30s, the British Antarctic Survey decided that they would be able to have people over winter in the Antarctic. Now, of course, there was no communication then, there was no way of getting out or anything, and so they chose a group of men, I'm afraid, um, who were enthusiastic, extroverted, chummy, very enjoyable people in a sense, and it was an absolute disaster. Well, and, and because they were extroverts, two, yeah. They were extroverted, everything along that line was an absolute disaster. And after two or three years, they realized what they needed to do was to choose very introverted individuals who were happy to spend time with themselves and didn't need fellows to talk with because there was no mobiles or anything like mm. that then. How would you comment on that? Oh, well, I'd go back to Robin Dunbar's research. So he's got... I'd just say Robin was in Cambridge. You said in the other place. That's where he really learned his stuff, in King's. Oh, he was. He was so he did, he did. He, of course, he was here. what do you mean? <laughs> but then he went over to Oxford. <laughs> and that's when I met him and spoke to him. Well, I met him in Cambridge. OK, so <laughs> that's why he's great. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm being very tribal and terrible here, aren't I? Now? Um, so, so Robin has also done some work on this. So he's got an idea that <clears throat> basically people that are extroverts um, and have a... So within that 150 uh, network number, there is variation. So there's some people that are able to have a much larger network. And actually, you can uh, look 
analyze the brain scans and you can have a look at the volume of the medial prefrontal cortex, I think it is, or I might be getting the name wrong, sorry. That's what I remember it as being. Is it? Okay, good, yeah. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> so if that area is slightly larger, um, then you're more likely to have a larger um, social network. And Robin's hypothesis is that there's basically a high number of beta endorphin slots within that larger brain region. And those individuals are literally being driven to have as many interactions with different people as possible in order to fill up those higher number of beta endorphin slots. People that are introverts have a slightly smaller region within that brain larger regions within, within other areas of the brain, and they have fewer of those beta endorphin slots, and so they don't feel as compulsed to go around and having interactions with as many people in order to feel sated. Now, both types of people are very important to society. So the introverts, if you want to call them that, um, generally speaking, put more energy into a smaller number of relationships and those, and that creates a wonderful village of support. And the extroverts, if you want to call them that, are very important to make sure that those village of supports don't become too parochial or like conspiracy theories. And so they can basically help to um, allow ideas to hop from group to group to group so that they don't become kind of echo chambers. So both types of people, very important and seem to have different brain profiles associated with them. <coughs> That was one of the findings in your book that like, fascinated me the most, actually. And I almost see the extroverts as being like kind of pollinators. Yes. Kind of spreading ideas between yeah. different flowers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Can I possibly raise one other thing for Hella to comment on? As she will well know, uh, a few months after the pandemic started, many people, myself included, were very concerned by the fact that the number of scientific papers submitted by men went up considerably, and the number submitted by women went down significantly. Yeah, so there was a big discussion about that within the scientific community um, and how it might reflect um, an unequal share of childcare when sp schools and nurseries were being closed. Um, yeah. I was lucky. I was in Queensland where the schools were open and the nurseries were open. <laughs> um, yeah, there was concern with that. So I think we have time for just one last question, and I see the mic. So uh, thank you so much. I'm from Germany, and I'm staying here for two weeks. And the special thing is, I have to work with new groups every day. And um, my question is, what advice would you have for someone in my position to activate collective intelligence in a new group uh, quickly? Uh, and you've got two weeks. I have to work every day um, here with new groups. Maybe um, there are different groups in, um, every day. And I feel that it's somehow challenging to open or get in contact with new groups, especially um, I'm, I'm not the native speaker and so on. Yeah. Do we have some quick tips um, to, yeah, if you make a brainstorming or something else to activate this collective intelligence? So Maybe events like brain writing would be brain yeah brain writing that's a really good idea yeah so um, brain writing for example where people write down ideas rather than verbally um, voicing them at committee meetings generates twice as many ideas because the introverts uh, or people that wouldn't want to suggest new ideas feel much more comfortable doing so and that also the ideas are less likely to follow the dominance dynamics and the ideas when they when they've um, independently assessed brain writing versus brainstorming. Brain writing is um, thought to generate ideas, twice as many ideas, but they're rated as useful. Um, also, you know, events help. So I used to be strategic manager for neuroscience here at the university um, because neuroscience research is in Cambridge in particular, but across many different universities, spread across many different departments and institutes, something like over 60 different departments and institutes here at Cambridge. And so we'd organise events where people would get together and have you know, a few minutes to present their work, not a huge extended time, and to try and have as many networking events as possible. And I even set up running clubs as well within different groups that I worked in to try and get our brains to synchronise. I didn't set up choirs because I'm really bad at singing but you could try that. <laughs> Having like a dance break in the middle of yes! a brainstorm would be a good idea. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, well, in Grey's Anatomy, they do that, don't they? They do a 30-second dance-off. <laughs> you know, between, like, in the surgery. I don't know whether you've noticed that. 
Um, thanks so much. I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation, and I'm sure the audience have Thank too. You. So thanks for everyone watching remotely. Thanks for all the questions. Um, just to remind everyone that the <laughs> book really is amazing, um, so I'd thoroughly recommend it, and Hannah will be signing copies yes. now. Yes. So. Thank you. Uh, Thank thanks you to Hannah.